Okay, uh, welcome to our um, ITS weekly seminar. Um, and uh, this is actually the last seminar of the quarter. And so I would like to use this opportunity to remind our registered graduate students for the class that uh, uh, you need to submit your uh, assignments for the class and you need to submit seven out of the eight. So, so uh, please do that. And, and then uh, um, uh, also I would uh, like to uh, uh, remind our audience that we'll try to keep uh, the uh, uh, questions at the Q&A. And unless you have a pressing question to uh, clarify things, we'll leave it to uh, the, the Q&A uh, part of the seminar. Um, so today, um, we're very pleased to have uh, Ms. Gillette, Gillette and Lily Shu to uh, give the joint presentation today. Um, since they'll share with you their experiences working in government and industry and their career path. So my introduction will be the shortest of the quarter. Uh, and uh, um, I want to let you know that Jilan is the manager of Caltrans California Integrated Mobility Program. And uh, Lily is the president and CEO of her own firm, which is called uh, Shoe Strategies. Uh, Jilan and Lily, and uh, welcome and the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. So uh, as Professor Zhang said, I'm Jillian Gillette from Caltrans. Uh, so uh, a bit about me since we've been asked to, to introduce ourselves and our sort of career path. So I've been in government now for 10 years. I've been working at Caltrans since 2019. I was recruited from the city and county of San Francisco where uh, I began my work in government in 2011 first as chief of staff to now Senator Scott Wiener and then as Mayor Lee's transportation policy advisor during Mayor Lee's tenure until he unfortunately passed away um, of a heart attack in 2017. Uh, so I came to government from the private sector where I worked for almost 20 years as a consultant doing business process modeling and workflow consulting, sort of management consulting focused on the, the, the financial services sector um, I was on the first e-statements team uh, with Charles Schwab when they decided to become a bank. So we put, uh, we got rid of paper statements to make, uh, help Schwab become a bank. That was very exciting to get rid of paper. Uh, and before that, I started my own startup. I was a co-founder of a startup uh, in the, in the first, first dot-com boom. Uh, I sold my startup uh, uh, made a bu bunch of money uh, and was able to have a family and then and then went into consulting. So um, my uh, before that, I worked for various different technology companies, uh, writing, uh, working on teams, writing parts of different operating systems uh, and different tools. Uh, and uh, before that, I worked in sort of um, an obscure financial sector called real estate tax certiorari. So um, it's been a long and winding career path. And I got here um, after getting a dual Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Sciences in philosophy and physics. <laughs> what a combination. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that's me. <laughs> Lily? Hi, yeah, Lily Shaw. great to meet you all today. Um, so my long and winding career path, similar to Jillian's, um, actually has always been focused on sustainable transportation options, um, but I have jumped around to different seats at the table addressing that question. Um, my background, my undergraduate degrees are in economics and public policy, and then I have a master's in city and transportation planning from the University of Maryland. Um, so I've always been very focused on urban development and urban change um, and thinking, thinking through the way that transportation systems um, underpin urban development and how changes in transportation can really impact uh, all the other outcomes that we care about in urban places. Um, the seats at the table I've had, I've worked in the public sector in Washington, DC. Um, I've worked in the private sector in consulting, and then also uh, with a mobility service provider, at, uh, most recently at Lyft. Um, and then I've been at the California Integrated Travel Project uh, for the past year. So excited to uh, share more about that work with you all today. And uh, just a, a confirmation that uh, uh, Lily has no relation with the parking 
Hurricane <laughs> Guru, UCLA professor, Donna Shu. <laughs> That's right. I've tried my whole career to not talk about parking, okay, uh, but when you work in yeah. transportation, you sort of have to. That's right. <laughs> but she's read the book, and every as everyone should. <laughs> Particularly right. if you're dealing with the public public transportation. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Lillian, Glenn, and you can get started with the sure. presentation. Well, so let's start in on the on the California Integrated Travel Project a little bit, um, uh, and sort of why why Caltrans, what's going on. Um, so we grew out of the 2018 California State Rail Plan. So the states are required to build a rail plan, and normally it's kind of a pro forma document. But in 2016, California decided to invest a bunch of money to uh, look at, could we really have a network? Could we have a network of rail and a, a, a non-freeway network in the state of California? Um, and the answer was, yes, we could. And what we don't. The problem that we don't have is a lack of infrastructure. In fact, what we have is a lot of transportation infrastructure and a lot of agencies and a lot of players, but they're not harmonized. Um, they don't plan together uh, and we're not really integrated. So the California State Rail Plan from 2018 called for a bunch of things, not the least of which was sort of an integrated way for people to pay, to make it easier to uh, switch from one system to another. And all of this is underpinned by our like very aggressive uh, pushing the envelope policy goals around, you know, making a, a more equitable society, um, reducing our carbon footprint so that the planet, uh, so that we save the planet, uh, and and really pushing alternative modes uh, to the single occupancy vehicle. So next slide, please. So um, the reason why we're doing this is should be pretty obvious. Uh, you know, we have like California is the poster child for these three pictures. These are very California pictures. We have, you know, the, the pandemic, the first picture is probably the most top of mind these days. The pandemic really showed, uh, exposed the, the, the known, um, but really gaping flaws in America's social safety net. Um, you know, uh, Donald Trump's checks, uh, paper checks, are still didn't make it to a lot of Americans who needed it the most. We spent about 60 million, 67, 67 million dollars of the the individual benefits checks went to check cashing firms uh, because lots of people who need the money don't have bank accounts. Um, we're heading into fire season. Fire season seems to be all year now. Uh, and traffic is definitely back, at least on my street. So um, these are all things that we need to grapple with intelligently. And Caltrans is sort of in the catbird seat for thinking about these things and doing something about it. It's an enormously powerful agency that um, built the California freeway system um, and has a lot of power and now you know, really needs to shift in order to meet these goals. So if we're going to, to, to rise to the challenge, um, California, we need to stop riding, uh, riding, uh, building freeways, and we need to become more, more of a network manager and embrace the kind of things that you're studying at Davis. We need to think about ourselves as a, as a center of excellence for data, uh, for strategy, uh, for efficiency, and really thinking about uh, modes, uh, innovation, you know, and efficiency. Um, so. Uh, these are different roles for, for a large government agency that poured a lot of concrete to put itself in. And so uh, Caltrans recruited a, a few people, including me, um, to start the California Integrated Travel Project, tearing off of the state, uh, the state rail plan. So the goal was to really think about, um, to take people who had sort of business strategy and technology background, to think about how to bring those sensibilities into Caltrans, um, to really push rail and transit forwards uh, by making them seamless and the obvious choices for uh, both industry, for industry, for jobs, uh, and for the riders themselves. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is integrated mobility? This is like a key question, um, and it and it's it's an important question to ask because when you talk about transportation this way the immediate response in the transit world is to think, oh, they're going to build software, they're going to build another app, they're going to build, you know, um, they're going to build something that is for transit. 
Um, and we're, we're asking we're, what we're doing, what we're th thinking, and then what we're doing is really not that. So next slide, please. Um, integrated travel to us really means thinking about the customer and thinking about transit as a seamless experience. Um, and that means that you need to make it as affordable as possible. There's already been a lot of focus on that. But fundamentally, you need to make it convenient, reliable, and obvious to the customer. Um, and that means looking at transit differently. Next slide, please. So um, coming from the private sector, as most of the Cal ITP team does, we've bounced between the private and we speak both public and private. A fundamental thing is to really put yourself in the shoes of the customer and not just the existing transit rider, but the 97% of Californians who don't even think of taking transit. What kind of cost consumer experience are they getting in mobility in other modes? What, what is it like to be that consumer? What is the consumer experience like? Um, what, is, what is popular? Um, and, and looking back at transit and saying, uh, what, what could we do there? Especially as we are Caltrans and we are the state and not an individual transit agency. So we adopted some business uh, practices in our, in our program. And one of them is to do a uh, sort of a business plan. Uh, and we started out in 2019 with a series of, you know, kind of research, market driven research uh, efforts. And the first of that was, first of them was a market sounding. So a market sounding is a light RFI where you ask, you go to the private sector, or the people who, the industry that builds things, and you ask them a series of structured questions to help guide your analysis about what kind of investments you might make. A market sounding is not intended to purchase to be the underpinning for a buy. Um, it's more like a real question for a request for information. So as the state of California, we did a market sounding and the response that we got from industry when we attacked the sort of mobility question at this level was really amazing. Usually if you do a market sounding around transportation payment, you get five or six different companies that do this for a living. In our case, we got Apple and Google and Visa and MasterCard, sort of global players who are who are very interested at the, of, of the question being asked uh, in this way at this level by the state. So uh, next slide, please. So learning what we did from the, engaging as we did with the private sector, what we heard was, um, <laughs> just adopt some standards for Pete's sake. There are actually standards in transit. You know, you have over, you have hundreds of transit agencies in California and they each do things differently. No wonder the customer is confused. No wonder you don't have a very much market share, frankly. What you should do is find standards, adopt them, stick with them. And if you as the government do that, then we will believe you and we will make the investments that are appropriate for our sector. And then it will be easier to speak to, to one another. So taking that uh, market sounding advice to heart, what we, uh, our analysis led us to adopt three sort of pillars of our program. The first is there is a standard in the payments industry. It's called Europay MasterCard Visa. It's the way that most of the, the planet uh, pays for things with their debit or credit card. Uh, it's going contactless. That's the standard. So we've adopted that. Um, and that's what we're trying to enable in transit. The second is um, making sure that that uh, payment method works for everybody. So that means that discounts and benefits and people who ex uh, experience a slightly different price need to have the same customer experience. How do we do that? And then the third pillar that we're adopting that we're working on uh, is, is, a, is a fundament another fundamental customer experience one, which is, you know, you can't buy something that you can't see. So if, you know, everybody needs to know where is the bus? It's okay if the bus is late, you know, it's not great, but tell me where it is. Uh, and please tell the customer that information on the thing that's in everybody's pocket, which is their cell phone. Uh, you know, make sure that your information is consistent. 
so that Google and Apple will include your product on the trip planning apps that, that are in everybody's phones. So those are our three things, consistent information about the product, um, consistent way to pay for it, and make sure that everybody pays for it the same way. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, these are not new ideas. Adopting a standard is a very American thing to do. Uh, one of the hallmarks of America is that you can look around on any baseboard in any building in the United States and you know what a three, what an outlet looks like. Um, there was some arguing about it in the 1980s when we argued about whether to add the third prong or not. But you can go to other countries where they haven't agreed on a standard and there are different things in the baseboards and you don't know which one to plug into. So uh, we're good at this in the United States. Um, and these particular standards that we're, uh, that we're adopting in CalITP, um, other countries have gone before us. So um, when, you, when you see re access to you know, contactless payments, uh, real-time information, here's some statistics from other places that have adopted these standards, uh, and you can quantify them. Um, so one of my favorite uh, political quotes is from Mike Bloomberg. It's, um, in God we trust, all others bring data. So here's the data. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so first of all, uh, let's, let's take a look at uh, the contactless payments vision. Um, uh, and so th this is a great picture of, of uh, you know, sort of what the customer experience is in a coffee shop. And this is what we want to bring you in transit. Uh, use that thing that's in your pocket already uh, and, uh, uh, and experience the simplified uh, product experience uh, in transit just as you do uh, when, you, when you purchase anything else. Next slide. So um, the advantages of contactless fare co collection are, uh, as, we saw, as we saw in the previous slide, they're, they're demonstrated through data in other countries. But um, contactless is something that really hit us with COVID that um, you know, paying for cash was never a great customer. Paying with cash was never a great smooth customer experience to begin with. And during COVID, it became toxic. Um, so there are obvious advantages and a bunch of them are enumerated here that you can just fundamentally improve the customer experience. Next slide, please. Uh, all right, and here's our second pillar, which is uh, automating the, the, the discounts so that uh, everyone who pays has the same experience. So right now I'd like to, to switch to Lily. Um, <laughs> because I should have passed to her before, but that's the, in the excitement of the project, I always want to talk about everything. So Lily, please take on. <laughs> Great, yeah, no, the, so just Julie mentioned the second program area is focused on ensuring that customers who are eligible to receive discounts for travel on transit, for example, many transit agencies have uh, discounts for older adults or for students or for people who are lower income or veterans. Um, ensuring that all of those uh, transit riders who are eligible for discounts have a great customer experience to receive and qualify for those discounts, but more importantly, that they can travel statewide on any transit system and receive their discount automatically. So that a transit customer knows that anytime they tap to pay, they're getting the best price that they can for that transit trip. Um, the way that we're doing that is by uh, working with other statewide partners to develop a, a very a secure uh, portal for people, for transit customers to qualify for those discounts using information that the state already has um, about, uh, about customers. So a transit user can um, uh, put in their information and then the discount is automatically honored whenever they tap to pay for a transit trip. Um, and that statewide integration is something that is facilitated by uh, Cal ITP being located at the state level. So we can work with other state agencies um, system, you know, statewide rather than uh, sort of region by region or even city by city. 
Uh, the third pillar of the, the Cal ITP program is really focused on that travel information. So making sure that transit customers have uh, quality information about where their bus or train is and when it will arrive. Um, and making sure that that information is standardized so that you can um, you know, know when your bus or train is gonna arrive regardless of which trip planning app or which device you use or, or however you wanna access that information. And in order for transit agencies to do that, we're using a global uh, transit specification called GTFS. It's the General Transit Feed Specification. And this is a global way that uh, transit agencies uh, publish information about their schedule and also the real-time arrival information about their, um, uh, the, where the location of their vehicles are. Our approach to this part of the project is really a three-step or a three-phased um, effort. So first, we want to make sure that we are setting very clear expectations for California agencies about what GTF is, GTFS is and how they should use it. Second is we are going through and working with over 300 California transit agencies to assess how they're doing, meeting those minimum uh, uh, expectations or those minimum guidelines. So not just uh, putting the standards out there, but really going through um, and helping each agency assess how they're meeting those guidelines. And then perhaps most importantly, and where we're spending most of our resources and effort is building uh, tools and technical assistance and strategies to develop customized and um, targeted uh, resources for each agency on how to meet those expectations. So that three-step approach is really um, uh, trying to not just put the information out there, but really work hand in hand with California transit agencies over time to um, build their GTFS in their phone and in their wallet or in their pocket. Um, the, the component of the GTFS guidelines that we are working on diligently this year and, and going forward is on GTFS fares. So this is a new component or a newer piece of the GTFS uh, specification focused on making sure customers have an accurate information about how much their trip will cost and publishing that information in a standardized format so that trip planning applications can give that information to the customers. This becomes a really important component of the future of mobility when we think about blended public and private travel where you might take a scooter to the train or take um, a bus to uh, a, a different location. Um, having that complete trip price information is really important for customers when they're uh, deciding on how they want to get around. So the, the Cal ITP program is going to be using this fares format uh, to code the fares for all California transit agencies over time. And we think this is going to be a great benefit to agencies, but also to transit customers as well. So just quickly um, highlighting how we work. Uh, so uh, Cal ITP is uh, both building this statewide um, effort of integration, but we're also using demonstration projects. The demonstration projects are an opportunity for us to work hand in hand with California transit agencies um, to generate learnings and understand how these uh, programs and these efforts actually work uh, in real time. What does the transition actually look like? So excited to share a bit more about uh, Monterey Salinas Transit, which was our first contactless payment uh, demonstration project that launched about three weeks ago. They're the first uh, open loop contactless fare payment system uh, in California and the first small agency in the US that has adopted uh, this global standard for contactless ways to pay. Basically, it lets uh, transit customers in Monterey Salinas uh, tap their phone, their mobile wallet, their watch, or their bank card, uh, or their credit card or debit card to the validator, you can see in the photo, um, to pay for their transit trip. We're also uh, going to be uh, integrating with that statewide uh, system for seniors to get discounted fares when they tap to pay so that the, um, we're testing out that uh, eligibility discount verification system. 
And then finally, uh, we worked with Monterey Salinas uh, and they have uh, completed their GTFS data feed so that all trip planning apps can uh, take their information and tell customers reliable information about their location of their buses. A key component of this and one we spent a lot of time on was working with the Monterey Salinas Transit uh, staff to make sure that the customers, the riders, had consistent information on how to pay and how to ride regardless of where they got that information. So we worked with Monterey to publish um, information on the bus in the little pamphlets you can see there. Um, we put decals on the buses, the exterior of the bus, so people know they don't need to fish around for um, uh, cash, but they can just use their, um, their card to pay for the ride. And then we also have information on the website that is very clear and customer focused, um, so people know the information as well. And then finally, uh, we, as I mentioned, we're working with uh, the Monterey Salinas team to develop data dashboards that are tracking progress on the demonstration over time. So at the end of the six month demonstration project, we have clear metrics of success that document um, both how customers responded to these new tools, um, but also how Monterey Salinas operational bottom line was impacted. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Jillian to talk about how not just what we're doing is innovative, but how we're doing it is also uh, driving change. Thank you so much, Lily. So Lily is a big part of how we're thinking outside of the bus. Her, her switching between public and private sector is sort of, is, is very indicative of the way that we work in California, in Cal ITP. As I mentioned before, a number of us have worked in both the public and private sector, so we speak both languages. Uh, and that's really important at this time as um, everything, uh, it, everything is about software, right? Everything is going onto the phones and all software is going up into the cloud. Uh, and the pace of change is, incre is increasing. So it is an incredibly disruptive time. Uh, and so being able to be conversant and in sort of both worlds uh, is really valuable um, for seizing the benefit for the public, um, starting with transit in our case. So uh, fundamentally what we're doing is uh, thinking differently about the customer. Like I mentioned before, we're thinking about not just existing transit riders, but we're thinking about the vast majority of people who don't use in transit in California, but who we want to invest, who we want to use in California, uh, we want to use uh, transit in California and trying to combine those two, uh, those two populations. So we're both leveraging and investing in technology um, we're, we're leveraging, we're, the, we're turning the bus is the bank, right? Uh, the fact that so many transit customers are under or unbanked is, is an opportunity and a threat. We are, um, we are making sure that the inequality that we have seen uh, in previous generations doesn't, isn't automatically written into this ne next generation. So the fact that there are so many underbanked people doesn't mean that we should uh, you know, continue forever to bolt cash fare, to bolt uh, uh, cash boxes to the floors of buses. We should figure out how to provide a digital alternative for everybody. Um, so that's the solution. And acting as the state of California with Caltrans, we've been able to attract um, discussions with the private sector to find out um, what are the you know impediments to issuing for the under and under unbanked? What are the what are the fees? What are the what are the blockages um, so that we can remove them and we can make uh, bring transit into the global payment system? Because at the end of the day, a transit transaction is no different than buying a cup of coffee. The way that you do that should be the same. That's what most people understand, and we need to make that so. Uh, and if we can do that, then we the doing it differently has these tremendously broader impacts to society. Um, we both make it simple and seamless for everybody to find and pay for transit uh, based on what's already in their pocket. Um, we reduce some of the horrific fees uh, that that under and unbanked people pay. It's very expensive to be poor. Um, Post COVID, we, uh, we can advance safer alternatives to cash and we can extend this thinking to the other modes. There are people who uh, are under an unbanked that are also driving and they're in those very long cash only lines on the, on the bridges and everywhere else. Um, and most important to I think everybody on the team, you know, the systems uh, that we use um, should not be a two tiered one, right? So, 
when I was a kid, um, uh, you know, we got food stamps for a while and then the money used to be purple and pink, right? The idea was to sort of create uh, a stigma around, uh, around being poor and that perhaps that would incentivize you to no longer be poor, right? I think we've, um, we've come a long way, uh, but we haven't come far enough and transit is, is one of the vestiges of the old ways of thinking. Certain aspects of transit are, are vestiges of the old way of doing it. So next slide, please. So um, thinking this kind of this kind of way allows us to um, really think about the over 300 transit agencies in the state of California um, as a wonderful opportunity to really build a network. To, to, and, and in the process, uh, if the state can take on um, providing services to the transit operators at scale, they can focus on the customer. They can focus on the thing that's their core mission, which is providing, um, providing service. So what we're doing in order to serve the, our customer, which is the transit, uh, the, the transit agencies, we are putting up a catalog of goods and services in the California mobility marketplace that where we've done the, the negotiations and we've done the research on behalf of transit operators and provided them with low cost alternatives um, to procuring on their own. Um, we are, we've also found through our research that there are literally gaps in the, in the marketplace for transit operators. If you're a small transit operator, there are actually products that you need that don't exist or the products that do exist are way too expensive and overbuilt for an agency of your size. We've identified the scope of those issues uh, and we are working on low cost uh, minimum reference products to fill that gap uh, until the, the private sector really understands the, the scope of the market opportunity in just in California. Um, and then really to, to cement that, um, we are focused on the back end of all of that, which is the sort of the data play that um, reifying data at the state, collecting the right data, structuring it appropriately, um, and asking it the right questions, and then showing policymakers and everyone um, what you can learn about the effectiveness of what you're doing um, by, by, looking at, by using your data appropriately um, is our focus. So the general transit feed specification is the core to all of that but, um, because it's a global standard already. There are over 2,500 agencies that use it. But um, buried in that global standard is a, is a point that I would really like to stress, which is standards are only good as good as they are implementable. There are lots of standards uh, would be standards that never made it because they were too hard. There wasn't a community of practice built around it um, that, that could be achieved. What GTFS has going for it and why it's so core to what we do and why we want to extend it um, is that there are over 2,500 agencies that are using it. It is, a, it is a standard of people who produce data in a certain way and then, and then other, and then companies, largely private sector companies, that scoop up the data and present it. Um, that that is a you know just fundamentally fundamental to the way that we that we think about the 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 business that we're in. Um, so yeah, so it, and allowing us to to amplify this way of doing business allows Caltrans to kind of. Re reclaim the mantle of um, leadership that it that it uh, held decades ago when you know people from all around the world came to California to see how we were building the freeways. Right now, now we can say, well, we are we are a, a leader in in data, in understanding how people are using the system, uh, and in facilitating a, a switch to of modes. Uh, and fundamentally driving down the prices of, of mobility and increasing democracy while we're at it. And mom and apple pie too. <laughs> so um, finally looking ahead, so what's, uh, what's next for us? Well, um, I think I alluded in a previous slide that, you know, there are folks paying for um, road tolls or bridge tolls with cash. 
Um, the the ideas that we're that we're rolling out with CalITP can be extended to um, additional modes. Um, we would like to do uh, more demonstrations to prove that this way of thinking and this way of acting are not just uh, interesting ideas, but just show your work, uh, like we're doing in Monterey Salinas. Um, we want to ex expand the, the marketplace of goods and services for transit operators um, uh, in, into more areas uh, in order to integrate the experience uh, so that transit operators that are interested can find what they need. Um, extending GTFS to um, additional, additional um, pieces of data that may be more of interest to the transit industry itself. Uh, or to, and or to customers. So extending GTFS into paratransit um, and non-fixed route transit. Um, and then continuing to have a different relationship with the private sector where we really all have a role um, and you know, keeping an active conversation. So next slide. So that's it. That brings us to the end of our, of our presentation. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and we would love to en engage in a dialogue with you and, and learn what, you, what you'd like to talk about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julian and Lily, and uh, it's great to know that Caltrans and ours has a focus, you know, one of us focus uh, on the transit side, not just on the freeway and, and the roads. Yeah. Um, so now we open up to uh, the Q&A, and I just want to remind our audience that uh, uh, we'll have our students um, ask the questions first because we are taking this as a class and they can use the chat or the raised hand feature to ask questions. And for our outside audience, we'll try to answer you know, um, all your questions and uh, you can use the, uh, um, the Q&A uh, feature to, uh, uh, to ask the, uh, your questions. I think the first question, um, you know, from the chat is from Tosan about and bank customers. I think Julian, you already mentioned that is try to, you know, have uh, find ways to have more people have, you know, being uh, um, have low cost uh, like credit cards and, and bank accounts. And so forth. Yeah. Do you want to comment more on that? Sure, a little bit. I think it's a great question, right? We talked about it in the presentation, but um, let me tell you a little story, and and maybe this will be helpful. So when I was a kid. Back in the day, um, it, banks um, it wanted banks want your money. They want to borrow your money so that they can lend it because that's how they make money, right? So, you, so the focus of American banking is on deposits. When I was a kid, banks would, in order to encourage you to, to open an account with them, they would give you a toaster or they would give you dishes, right? So if you were sort of the lower middle class like my family was, um, you would open a new, you would switch accounts every six months or so. You could get a toaster for six months and then by switching banks, you could get the dishes, right? So that was not a great way. Uh, that was a very expensive way for banks to increase customers. So uh, it just so happened that in the, eight, the late 70s and early 80s, um, the beginnings, the, the precursors to Visa and MasterCard came about uh, and presented an option to banks of um, providing something other than a toaster to customers, which is a, a way to uh, make payments digitally um, so that if you had an account, you could use it even though you couldn't get the cash out of the bank at the time. So the toaster became uh, a payment device. Um, because we've connected those two things in the United States, that's how many people think about uh, debit and credit cards. Payment, a payment mechanism, isn't a bank account. It's a separate industry. Um, and new players, uh, many of whom are based in California, are really helping remind us that those two things are separate. You should not be required to be able to loan a bank $300 a month minimum balance in order to be able to transact in the United States, right? you should be able to have the basic plumbing of payments. And in fact, most people do um, already. And so if they're, if they're missing that and they're only paying in cash, um, we should attack the problem and, and at least give them an alternative if they want one. Um, that's, that's very important. And um, 
for issues where there's a, if the reason somebody's not paying digitally because there's a trust issue, first of all, that's not that many people. And it's also important that we should be asking ourselves why that's the case. If there's a problem that people don't want to pay digitally, we should understand what that is. Um, that's all I'd like to say about that. <laughs> Great. And uh, Adia, uh, yeah, you can ask your question. Thanks, Michael. Uh, very interesting presentation, Lillian and Lily. Thank you so much. Uh, two questions, right? One, maybe an extension to what Prashant is asking on the unbanked. Uh, have you considered, uh, I mean, people might still prefer cash, but have you considered looking at cash machines where they could insert cash and get like a payment card, then they don't have to deal with having to, you know, have credit history or whatever else, but it still allows them to do contactless payment and not have to worry about digital issues with trust, et cetera. That's one. The second question was a little different. Uh, 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 there, is, there is a huge opportunity uh, for you to actually engage with payment companies like Google, Apple, et cetera, because as, Cal as, as Caltrans, you have a lot of access to commuter patterns and data on mobility, and you could effectively give them some aspects of that data subject to privacy, et cetera, uh, but basically then negotiate some pretty interesting advantages on transaction costs on payment systems. And uh, just wanted to get your perspective on how, if, if that is a discussion that's happening and what uh, has probably ensued on that. Those are awesome questions. Uh, and, and Lily should really elaborate on these, I think, because this is exactly what, what why we brought Lily on. Lily's really thinking about that issuance question. So the answer is to your first question is yes, absolutely. And I will die on the hill of wanting you to put that cash on a general purpose card. Because putting the cash on a card that only lets you pay for transit doesn't solve the equity problem. I want you to be able to transfer your cash onto a general purpose card that you can pay for a cup of coffee and transit if you choose, because that's how my life works and that's how everybody's work, life should work. Um, and and Lily's, uh, Lily's working on exactly that and I'd love for her to, to talk about exactly that. So the second question about Caltrans's role also is a yes, a strong yes, that, you know, there are lots of data brokers right now. Everybody wants big data and buying da you know, big data. And um, we have a lot of data. We have a lot of access to data. And we should be thinking in a much more modern way about what our role is, right? Exactly to your point. And I think thinking about the, you know, what the, bal the right balance sheet is to achieve the maximum public benefit and also something that the private sector can live, you know, can build reasonably. That's the game. You, I mean, you're spot on questions about, uh, you know, so the kind of position that we're trying to put ourselves in. Can I just add on the, the cash question? So um, many of the payment providers, payment industry providers are negotiating cash top up networks right now so that you can go to Walmart or 7-Eleven or, um, you know, a convenience store, or maybe even the DMV or your transit agency station, or your transit station to add cash to a card. As Jillian said, though, the key finding that we had was that for many, especially lower income customers that are, you know, budgeting and very concerned about where every dollar goes, locking up those limited funds into just a transit card is actually a real hurdle and barrier for them because they are, you know, uh, very concerned about being able to use that for whatever other needs might come up. So having the ability to pay for transit, but also whatever other needs they have is actually um, a real benefit and, and something that the industry is really moving towards. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> For students, if you have questions, you can you know, raise your hand. So before you know, student raise a hand and uh, Julian, uh, do you have statistics about you know, what's the percentage of people who are still paying for cash uh, for transit services? Yeah, so thanks for that question. It's a hard question to answer um, because transit doesn't really think of itself as a business this way. So getting the numbers out are, are very difficult. It's not, and you know, the way that transit reports has a different focus. Um, 
what I can say is that in, well, so most, by, by the numbers, most of the transit agencies in California require exact change. That's the only thing you can pay for, pay with. I mean, you know, there, so, the agencies tend to be very small, uh, so small that they don't, have a procure, they don't have procurement staff. So they can't buy anything. So the only time they buy something is every 12 years when they get to replace their bus and their bus comes with a cash fare box bolted to the floorboards. So that should give you a strong indicator of kind of this structural um, problem that we have in transit. In many of the more sophisticated systems that have like smart cards, for instance, well, there's not that many of them. There are four of them in California. You, you generally see, uh, you see, you know, 50 or more, significantly more percentage of cash still. The vast majority of the, of the money is being moved in cash. Presumably, we can, um, each agency can look at, you know, by the end of the year or months and how much sort of uh, cash revenue we receive versus the total, you know, revenue we receive probably can estimate uh, some kind of numbers. So that's uh, too long. No, yeah. some of them you can't actually, they just can give you a general monthly revenue number and they can't break it down by sales channels. Like it's, you know, it's a, we, transit is really operated as a, as a public benefit. A lot, so the kind of systems like that, the your the the sort of more finance, more business oriented system ways of thinking about the problem um, haven't aren't ex in existence all the way across transit. I just add that part of what we are doing with Monterey Salinas Transit is building that dashboard so that they do have that information over time for um, their system and can be able to both assess how it's going on the demonstration, but also to be able to make service adjustments if needed, depending on what, uh, what they're seeing as far as utilization of different payment methods and across different lines looks like. Um, so that's something that we'll be, we'll be working with them on and then you know, use, making that dashboard available to other California transit agencies as they uh, move forward with different options. I remember about 12 years ago, we did the, uh... 6i5 project, we need to collect transit data from the region, you know, regional transit and then some other um, transit agencies in the greater Sacramento area and also the light rail. Um, we have to, um, you know, the, the light rail, uh, we have to board the trains to actually collect, you know, to count how many passengers each train and across uh, a kind of a, like a coding line that, uh, and we did that. And we also checked with their numbers and see the consistency. Uh, because the, the uh, uh, transit agencies do not have enough people to do a you know car by car check. We uh, we are doing on uh, quite a bit of rough estimate. But for some transit agencies, we have these uh, called ATP automatic track yeah passenger counters APT uh, uh, yeah. APC and uh, and that will give a sort of more reliable number for the trans transit ridership. Um, well, it's, more, well, it's more reliable, but it's not fully reliable. There's no great answer here. I mean, if you look on our website over at Caltrans, we did a market sounding on passenger counting, right? Because it's a really interesting question. In the same way that each agency makes its own, there's over 300 agencies. They make their own decisions about everything. There is not a standardized form of passenger counting either. And every bus every bus purchase is custom in California. So there, you know, that makes it very difficult for the market to respond with a reliable product because the variation is so high. Um, so, that, you know, I could go on for hours about this guy, but you can kind of see it. Once you start to see these, you'd be like, oh, <laughs> you can't. this is hard to answer because this, but this varies 300 times, how do we, which pieces of this could we get everybody to agree on so that we can have a three-pronged outlet <laughs> in every in every bus? Yeah, and, and 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 also you know finding allocations that depend on ridership, and if, <laughs> so it's a, uh, yeah it's a circle. Yeah, uh, we have uh, some questions uh, from our uh, you know uh, non-student audience. So I want to move to them, and um, there's one um, you know audience asked. How does the ITP plan to connect to small shared vehicles and their ability to support community, to support commuters in their first 
and lost my own journeys. So like a bike share, scooter and others, and uh, is there any partnership with Caltrans, APB and, and things like that? Huh, Lily, that sounds like something you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> well, this uh, this uh, person is anonymous, so I don't know who it might be one of your <laughs> folks uh, at Gojas. So. Plant. Um, yes, it's a great question, um, and something that we are currently doing a uh, market sounding with CARB, the California Air Resources Board, on multimodal trip integration and how the state should uh, facilitate increasing multimodal trips where exactly that, where a shared bike or scooter or um, a, a carpool or even a walking trip is combined with a transit trip or another mode to cre create a multimodal trip making. Um, this is important for uh, CARB because they're wanting to measure how many emissions re reductions we see from multimodal trip making like this. Um, in order to give transit agencies credit for uh, clean, you know, clean and sustainable options to access transit, but also to give credit to um, private mobility providers who connect to transit. So um, it's sort of a, 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 an interesting question to understand. Um, we saw great alignment and a lot of good ideas from the industry in terms of how the state should facilitate and continue to support more multimodal trip making. Things that we are already talked about, like integrated payment systems, um, making sure that, that we have uh, standardized information, GTFS for transit, but things like GBFS for bike sharing and uh, scooter sharing. Um, but also thinking that it was actually quite difficult to measure those trips. So CARB's interest was very much in understanding the trips as they're happening. And in order to protect customer privacy and, um, uh, and uh, accounts, um, that's a very difficult and potentially um, longer term question that we didn't find a good answer to. So definitely something that Cal ITP is interested in and um, more to come on that soon as we publish the results of that market sounding. There's even more sort of a, a provocative uh, question for you. It's a, a proposal, is how about free transit? Don't charge anything. Well, um, so, don't don't charge anything. Uh, so fair, fair less and free are different, right? So <clears throat> one of the fun things about putting together Cal ITP is we have a combination of consultants and and civil servants working on it. So some of our consultants come from overseas, and so when you describe how transit works, if you are poor here, freaks them out because so. So this is the customer experience of transit in the United States, right? If you go to Macy's and you buy a t-shirt, you give them the t-shirt and you give them their, your card and they give you the t-shirt back in a bag and they give you your card back. That's it and off you go, right? Let's play that out in transit. You go, you go with the t-shirt and you hand them your card and they say, put that away, what is that? And then they, and then they say, how old are you? Or what's your income? Or do you have a disability? And you look at them like, what? And they say, well, you're taking too long. Um, here's, here's our rule book. Go stand over there, read our rule book, and you figure out what which ticket you want to buy, which ticket is appropriate for you, because we have different ones, and there's 30 of them, and you pick which one you want. And then and then when you're done, and you've just read the rule book, and you've decided which ticket you want to buy, there's a lady over there in the corner behind the bars. See her? You bring your money, whatever that is, to that lady, and she will send you sell you a ticket. And then you come back with that ticket and then you give us this piece of paper and then we'll give you the t-shirt. That's the experience of, 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 of payment. Um, so you could say, well, that whole thing sucks. Let's just throw it all away and make it free. Okay. Uh, if you remove everything about payment because, the, because of that idea or because somebody doesn't have it, how do you know when to add any more service? How do you know when to invest in transit? How do you know how many seniors are using a particular line versus how many veterans? It's important to be able to count things. So in countries that care more about people and have a social safety net, they don't require the transit operator to tra charge a different price for the same thing. They give the person money to pay for it. So, so free transit is is a is populism 
Um, and in my opinion, and once you get off of a free transit trip, if somebody doesn't have a general purpose account, just because you've made transit free, you know, they're going to get off and want to buy a cup of coffee and they still don't have a way to buy a cup of coffee. So, um, it sounds nice, but it's a, uh, it's more complicated than that. I'd, I'd also just add that, in, that we've that Jillian and this has had a lot of conversations with some of the transit agencies in California that are considering fare free systems or thinking about you know changes to their fare policy, and um, they're actually really excited about the potential for Cal ITP sort of thinking to help them with those implementations. So in Los Angeles, the proposal is for low income and students to have be fare free, and so some of the eligibility verification processes that we talked about is actually going to be very important to implementation of those. So I still think that there's um, some great in, uh, interest there as well. Exactly. You can free is you can charge zero dollars, but you still want somebody to have an account. That's the important thing is you want them to have the basic plumbing of payment. Even if they can't afford it, you can find a different way to solve that problem. Well, I think uh, um, there's, um, uh, Bingham, do you want to ask your question? He's still there. Um, this is from our outside audience. Maybe I'll, I'll read the question. Okay. Uh, so he asks, what is more important than mobility is accessibility. Would you please explain whether you consider developing integrated land use transport strategies for the city to enhance accessibility, not only mobility. So he's seeing whether you have a plan to in, you know, integrate the land use uh, rather than focus just on transit itself. And, and, in, and you know, I think uh, in, in California particularly, it's very auto-oriented sort of urban form and puts uh, transit at a disadvantage because of the low density. Um, so does yeah. Caltrans and... Uh, mm -hmm. I get the question, I'm trying to think about how to answer it because I'm a civil servant. So, I, so look, um, transportation and land use often are, are they're, they're, you know, the flip sides of the same coin. Um, we have built a state where we don't build enough housing and we force people to drive uh, until they can afford to live. And, and that drives up the cost of transportation and is melting the planet. Um, so are they related? Absolutely. Um, is Caltrans in a position to do something about it? Absolutely. We should stop building freeways and we've, we are trying to not build freeways anymore. That's tough sledding. Um, uh, so what Cal ITP is doing about it is trying to put the data on the table. So GTFS is really core to that, right? If you can see, so as of the end of last year, we achieved something which is kind of low key, but uh, in awesome in my opinion, which is at the end of the year, we got every transit agency in California to comply with static schedules, GTFS. So we haven't built it yet, but at the end of last year, you could um, know definitively that if you didn't see a transit trip option in a part of California, that was because transit didn't exist there. Not because there was some and they just didn't know how to present it to the consumer, right? So there are places in California where there's transit and there's places in California where there's not transit. And that alone, getting that on the table is I think a partial answer to this question of like, you know, we're going to show you the data. We're going to show you where there is transit, where there isn't, where there's robust transit, where there's not. You can overlay those data sets with land use questions, uh, with land use patterns, and I think they sh they should there sh they should be asked together. But you have to get the data on the table. So there are extensions of GTF. Once you have GTFS, you can build on it. Um, so there's a company called Conveil on the East Coast that does exactly that. They marry transportation service areas and transportation plans with 
priority development areas and land use plans, and they help policymakers and are building tools to help policymakers put exactly those two things together. And Caltrans should do that, in my uh, opinion. Uh, a question from a student, Hussein, asks, are there any plans of moving towards a mobility as a service type of market structure in later periods using the transit as the backbone? So basically are integrating mobility as service with transit, like serving last mile, first mile, and then for track lines, you know, you use PRT or like rail or like things like that. Uh, are there any uh, sort of... Uh, pilot projects or plans in Caltrans for this kind of uh, services? Yes, yeah, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask that because I like, <laughs> I'm like a mom, right? So I'm the person who comes in there and says, okay, you can't have any dessert until you eat your peas and carrots, right? Like, I don't know what mobility as a service is. To me, it sounds like kind of a foofy term, frankly. Um, to me, it's like dessert maybe, or it's like, you know, puff. Uh, we exist in a world where you couldn't see where all of the transit was because the transit operators didn't know how to fill out a spreadsheet because nobody asked them to and nobody taught them how or nobody told them that it was important, right? You can't manage what you can't measure. So, you know, we're pursuing a project in which we want to make sure that everything that exists is on the maps and that the price of it is known, right? Um, and we're adopting a global payment system. So in my opinion, it's a really big win if you can use the same thing to pay for your scooter trip as you can pay for your transit. That is integrated and that is already, you know, the service there is the payment service. That's, that's the mobility service. The payments, the mobility services that the payment service is extended across everything. Transit, coffee, bike share, Book, <laughs> those are basics. If we want to get more into discussions about how we price those things in order to really say, I want books to be more popular than cars or whatever, that's an important conversation to have too, but you can't have it until you can measure, until they're all on the same playing field, in my opinion. I Just to add on just quickly, yeah, I, I think I, that, I I was just gonna say, just to add on quickly, I think um, we're really focused on making sure that transit gets the fundamentals in order to be the backbone of a future mobility as a service ecosystem. But we're not there yet because we need to do the, the sort of the plumbing to make sure that transit is able to play that role in the future. Um, and I'd say that actually goes back to um, the other question about land use and transportation is part of what we're doing is, you know, land use and transportation development are a cycle, right? So one influences the other and the other influences transit. So by focusing on transit, we are driving development and density towards transit served areas. And um, that's just one piece of that, that cycle, but it's an important piece that we think is in, uh, needs to get be done in California. And uh, also because of the COVID-19, there's a, a kind of a outward, you know, population move, sort of movement from the urban areas to more like the ex-suburbs and the kind of things that uh, you think that will put, put a pressure on transit services in terms of like uh, you know, losing some of the customers or encourage uh, them. In my opinion, I think the, the jury is still out on terms of what the longer term impacts from the past year are. Um, but I do think that what, what we can say is that people are eager to have more choices for how they get around. And that applies whether you're in a suburban or a rural or a hyper urban area. And so transit um, services will continue to be critical and fundamental towards meeting California's goals, but we need to make sure that transit services are equipped to meet those goals by having the, you know, the kinds of resources we talked about today. Yeah, and we, I mean, to go back to our our beginning slides about some of the existential threats, right? Like, you know, people are moving out into the forests, right? Which are burning, right? So that like, these are all of a piece. Um, this, you know, the suburbanization of poverty um, is not great, right? Like one of the members of our team grew up in paradise, which is no more, it burned down, right? So like, I, I think, um, 
we need to be nicer to people. We need to build more housing. <laughs> we need to make sure that there is a social safety net, that we level the playing field, um, and that um, the, the technology advances that California is so great at include everybody, that we don't make the inequality worse as, as more and more things go into the phones, like better, better and faster, more elegant tools for the people that are already blessed is is not sustainable. Yep, sustainability, equity, efficiency, and all important metrics for <laughs> transportation. Uh, you know, it's a it's a service to uh, to people and for accessibility and mobility. Here, here. One last. Yeah. Is there any more questions for Lily and Janine? It looks uh, like we'll there's a few the, in the chat, uh, Michael. There's a, I checked the chat. Uh, let me see. One from Bailey. Uh, oh, I, I think uh, Su uh, uh, Su Susie, uh, Susie Pike. Uh, I don't see from Bailey, but uh, Susie. Uh, would you like to uh, to, um, to ask your question? I think we should just want to see how long. Oh, I think uh, um, so. Susie, are you there? Okay, so I'll ask the question for her. So, uh, oh the, no, I'm uh, here. <laughs> can you talk a little about how the transit? Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, you can ask the question yourself. No worries. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited that you guys are here and talking about all the great work you're doing at Cal ITP. And uh, I would love to hear you talk a little bit also about how the transit agencies are responding to the effort. I imagine there's a lot of different responses and then in what ways Cal ITP is sort of um, providing them support to be able to transition. I think the demonstration projects are probably an awesome example of that, but I was wondering if you could expand on it a little more. Well, so, um, you know, I live here in San Francisco in the Bay Area where we're pretty well served. Like everybody should be as lucky as the Bay Area. There's the MTC, the M MPO takes care of the agencies. They take care of themselves there. You know, nobody has enough money, but, but um, it's really different in the rest of California. Um, the transit operators and their customers look seem to be falling off of all the cliffs, right? There aren't enough jobs, the air quality is bad, uh, there's not enough housing, that is also expensive. So my, it's been really interesting to come from San Francisco and move to Caltrans. So the, the smaller agencies that depend on Caltrans, it's a little bit of a love-hate relationship because the Caltrans is like the big brother and is the, you know, the fiduciary, um, fiduciary for them. On the other hand, they're, they're, they're super upfront about like, there are all these problems that they can't solve that they need help with. So generally like, it's been great. The transit operators are like, do more. <laughs> where, where have you been for the <laughs> past 10 years? Like we, you know, they're very supportive. Um, I think some agencies are, they're so used to fighting with each other over money because there's so little money. Um, that 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 that's true also, um, uh, uh, but I think the 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 other thing that seems also to be turning the tide in addition to the demonstrations themselves is is like a GTFS example, right? Where in our data assessments we can look at the gaps in transit agencies' compliance with GTFS, and we can see in a in a particular error we can see a particular error. And we can see it multiple times. And then we look as Caltrans at what that agency is using to produce the data. And it's the error is not caused by the agency not complying. It's the error is because of the vendor. <laughs> so us, uh, where we get also um, support from the transit agencies is we say, well, um, we know about this error. We're happy to call the vendor. Um, and talk to them about fixing this because we see it, you know, 15 times in the state of California. And, and that makes them happy. That makes the transit operator happy. They're like, yes, please go call the vendor and fix it. 
I have a question from Lane and she asks, are you looking at what LA Metro is up to? And she said she'd love to hear about them in the conversation and the past uh, tax measures and lots of innovation. So uh, do you have really any comments or thoughts on that? That's where Lily is. LA Metro is awesome. <laughs> they're doing, they have, they're very well funded. Um, they're doing amazing thinking. I think the Fairless Fair initiative is very interesting. Um, uh, and, you know, the, and the amount of sales tax that they've passed for, for transit is, is really stunning. Um, it, you know, uh, there are what, 78 agencies in the, in the TAP area, is that right? I think that's right, in District 7. It's a huge area. Um, uh, um, yeah, I don't know how long they can sustain it. Sales tax, you know, I think that the era of increasing sales tax to keep their momentum is maybe over. So I'm very hopeful that we can um, grow to the size of being more helpful to LA Metro. Uh, what do you think, Lily? Yeah, I think we're, we are talk to LA Metro all the time and are very supportive of their work and their innovation teams are doing great, great things. Um, I think Metro is really inter interesting case as well because they are the regional uh, fair payment system, but they're also the operator. Um, so they have a different perspective than some of the other sort of regional system payment systems. Um, and then Metro is also unique because they operate the bike share system, the docked bike share system. So they're already a multimodal provider, mobility provider. And, and um, that's a really interesting um, and very different than a lot of other transit agencies in California. Um, and I just looked it up, TAP has 26 different transit systems as part of it. So it's just a huge amount of coordination that Metro provides for the LA County region. There's a, a follow-up question from Bains Bainham is about whether you develop performance matrices um, for from the data and to use it to prioritize, you know, your sort of operation investment strategy and so forth. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we aspire to being able to do that. Absolutely. So Oregon did that first, right? So um, about a dozen years ago, shortly after GTFS started. Um, trip planners, you know, build your own trip planner app was everywhere, right? Everybody wanted to get into the app business. So Oregon DOT, like most DOTs, has limited money. Um, and they had some money and they had to make a decision. Should we want everybody to see all the transit there is in Oregon? Should we, you know, should we build a trip planner? And they talked to TriMet, which invented GTFS along with Google. Um, and they realized how powerful an idea GTFS was. So what Oregon uh, decided to do instead was to, as a DOT, incentivize all of the transit agencies to become compliant with GTFS. Then Oregon took its money and instead invested on a different piece of software, which is called T-Next, which is kind of old code now, but it does, it's a step in exactly that direction. It looks T-Next, analyzes GTFS feeds, um, to see where there are gaps in the network or where there, where uh, a particular transit operator clearly needs another bus. And so ODOT uses TNEXT as one of its decision points for uh, supporting how to make investments, right? Like this is a gap we should close in the network or this is where, where we should add more buses. Great, okay, um, one last chance, uh, any more questions, either from our students or from our outside audience. Chisha, uh, you raise your hand. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so I, this is a question maybe a few of us have, um, but how, what, what are your opinions on integrating transit um, with uh, like Uber, Lyft, TNCs for the like first mile, last mile question? Um. Yeah, so look, I think um, there are places, it's a, you have to answer the question in two different ways, right? You have to answer it sort of from a policy perspective, and then you also have to answer it practically, I think. So from a policy perspective, I, I would say that there's some troubling, some st troubling statistics about the, the business model. The deadheading is really a problem. 
um, and that's been quantified um, of the TNCs, right? It's, it, there's efficiency at scale, there are pretty serious efficiency problems. So that's a policy issue in my, in my opinion. From a practical standpoint, there are lots of places in California where it will be a very long time um, before we can have fixed route or even demand route transit service. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, anything that, uh, if the TNCs want to focus on delivering to transit and handing off to transit, I'm all for it personally. Um, we want to make sure that that, that it's not pulling trips off of transit. I think that would be counterproductive. And so figuring out how to, what, what the, the, the performance metrics of, of that are pr practically is a very interesting problem. I don't know, Lily, what do you think? No, that, nothing to add, that's exactly right. I think um, part of the focus for Cali TP and CARB has been on exactly that question, making sure that we are um, using research and data and evidence of um, where transit works best and where TNCs are and, and how we can use policy levers to get, get the environmental and the equity outcomes that we wanna see from an integrated system that includes both. Yeah, I guess one other stab at that, since it's, it sounds, Tricia, like you were saying, several people are, were asking about that. So I, I have been in meetings where the agenda item right before me was Uber um, trying to sell its service um, to smaller transit agencies. And the pitch is, um, it's easy. It's a streamlined customer experience. You know, customers can book and pay for, for a trip in our app. Um, that they're used to paying for. And, and that's a pretty strong message, right? They're really, they're really capitalizing on a, a clean, attractive customer experience that's really consistent with the retail experience. So kudos to them for, um, I think, coming to the same realization that we have, which is you just have to make it easier for the customer. Um, is that the right way to do it um, through, you know, Uber does have, it's a, one of the walled gardens, right? If you do everything in their app, then Uber gets all of that data. Um, you don't understand, they understand the customer, they own the entire customer experience and they don't leak that customer experience out to others, which is hard if you're in my business, which is public service and you want to know where to invest in the public transit system. So, um, you know, those are all interesting things to think about, right? Yeah, thank you so much. So our audience also, uh, sorry, our audience asked, you know, follow this uh, uh, follow up of this question is uh, asked, can this be integrated with employers, commuter, or couple programs? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so um, at its core, the fact that we're automating eligibility discounts, like, you know, one discount is really the same as another. You just need somebody to stand by. Somebody needs to stand by an, an, an attribute of somebody's identity, right? And say, yes, yes or no, right? So who does that? And what are the business rules? Um, and how do you do them at scale is technically simple, politically difficult. I would say a third piece is, in my opinion, the commuter benefits laws the commuter benefits, you know, legislative underpinning in the United States is very old. I mean, it's, it's legislation from the 80s, I think, if I recall, mm -hmm. um, that's geared around this idea of passes, like the entire legislative regulatory framework of it needs a refresh. Um, so maybe, maybe that's something that we could look at in the future. But yes, can you give a group of people a discount because that group of people works for a certain employer? You bet. Okay, uh, uh, you know, given the time, we have just one minute left. And our last question is about high speed rail and BRT master plan. So have you seen the BRT master plan? And what about high speed rail? <laughs> uh, I have not, I've been so busy trying to get transit operators to publish their schedules and help them and get procurements out the door that uh, I'm a huge supporter of high-speed rail. I have not looked at the BRT master plan, uh, but I, I, I can't wait for us to, um, to have high-speed rail uh, and I hope I'm not uh, too old to enjoy it. <laughs> Lily, what do you say? 
<laughs> Not much to add. I'd just say the uh, adding different modes like BRT or high-speed rail um, is facilitated and made much easier to integrate when you bring the global standards that we mentioned. So um, this is really building an ecosystem that is flexible and mode agnostic so that we can do things like integrated systems for future modes. So with that, I, you know, I want to thank our speakers, Lydia and Jillian, you know, for the wonderful discussion and presentation. And I hope that we can maybe have the next one on a, on a high speed rail. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, uh, well, with that, yeah, um, you know, uh, we'll close the uh, today's seminar and, uh, you know, this is a, a memorial long weekend. I want to thank our speakers and all the speakers, you know, before this one as well and our audience for participating in the seminar. Thank you, have, have a nice long weekend. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.